UW360 is proudly supported by Pacific Office Automation, Copy, Print, Workflow, and IT, Problem Solved. Hi everyone, I'm Carolyn Douglas. Welcome to UW360. We're joining you from busy University Way Northeast, or the AV, as it's long been known around here. This street is home to all kinds of cool shops, theaters, restaurants, cafes, favorite hangouts for UW students and staff alike. It's also in for some pretty big changes soon. We're gonna take a closer look at that a little later in the show. We'll also take a seat in one of the coolest classrooms around. This is a class with no tests, no homework, and no grades. That's right, just learning purely for the fun of it. We'll also take a closer look at the incredibly successful partnership between UW and Seattle City Light and see one of the latest great projects to come out of that partnership. And we get some expert advice from renowned UW relationship expert Pepper Schwartz on how to avoid heartbreak in online dating. But first, a professor at the University of Washington, Tacoma, has written a new book about an African-American sharecropper and poet named John Hancox, who helped unite farm workers in Arkansas in the 1930s. Professor Michael Honey is promoting his book called Sharecropper's Troubadour, in part by performing some of Hancox's songs. Stacy Sakamoto was in the audience during one of Professor Honey's recent performances. But the planters and the bosses Throw the people out of their shacks. There is a mean things happening in this land. He may sound more like a folk mean singer than a university professor, but Michael Honey is actually the Fred and Dorothy Lots Haley Professor of Humanities at the University of Washington's Tacoma campus. His latest book melds his wealth of knowledge of labor and civil liberties land. history with his love of music. The book is called Sharecropper's Troubadour, John L. Hancock's The Southern Tenant Farmers Union and the African American Song Tradition. So hungry, hungry are we. John Hancock's ancestors included a former slave and a slave owner. He grew up in Arkansas in the early 1900s and his father was a poor sharecropper. Hancock's knew how to read and write and he put his observations about social injustices into verse. The planter lives off the sweat of the sharecropper's brow. Just how the sharecropper lives, the planter cannot howl. And he was saying to people, I'm trying to show you what things are like, why they're wrong, and why you have to do something about it. No more morning. No. Hancock's joined the Southern Tenant Farmers Union in the 1930s. Honey says Hancock's words helped unite farm workers, both blacks and whites. The songs motivated them to seek change without arousing suspicion that speeches would. If the police heard that or anybody from the white community except people in the union, uh, you'd be beaten up, arrested, killed, something bad. But if you sang the song, they may not realize <laughs> the power of what you were doing there. But the outspoken Hancocks eventually did attract the attention of a lynch mob, and he was forced to flee. He settled in San Diego, out of the public eye, for 40 years. Everybody thought he was dead because he had sort of disappeared. And the reason he disappeared was that a lynch mob came to kill him in Arkansas, and so he fled, and a lot of other people fled as well. Hancocks resurfaced in the 1980s when Pete Seeger learned that he was still alive. That's when Honey met Hancocks at a conference on labor and civil rights songs. And John got this overwhelming reception because, you know, most people don't know who he is. Uh, Pete Seeger said he's one of the most important folk musicians of the 20th century and the least known of all of them. Most of his songs actually have themes that uh, are still very much with us. That's where Honey first put Hancock's poetry to music. Hancock's died in 1992 at the age of 88. 
He spent his later years performing at labor rallies, eager to share his music. Cause the union's going on. Now Michael Honey is doing the same. I say that if this history happened and we don't know that it happened, then what good did it do? In this land. Professor Honey's book, Sharecropper's Troubadour, is available at the University of Washington Bookstore, right here on the Ave. When we come back, learning purely for the fun of it, as UW 360 continues. Welcome back to UW 360. Imagine a class with no homework, no tests, and no grades. Just learning purely for the fun of it. Sound good? Then you might want to check out the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at the UW. It offers lessons of a lifetime for anyone over 50 years old with a passion for learning. This is the Jewish Bible, the Jewish translation of the Hebrew Bible into English. Behind the doors of this classroom in the Everett Senior Center, an age-old discussion ensues about the history of world religions. Now, how do I pick passages from sacred books to sample? But there's one big difference with this class. No tests, no grades, no homework, just a lot of fun, new friendships, new ideas. In this classroom, it's just reading, listening, and learning, simply for the fun of it exactly what Deanna Duncan Smith was looking for. I wanted to network with good people. Um, I wanted to learn more. I wanted to keep active. I wanted to become bright. <laughs> and I'd heard about Osher, so you put that all together and it seemed to be the solution. Well, Muhammad liked to climb Mount Hira outside of Mecca. This is what the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute is all about, learning for fun. Its UW branch launched in 2006 and is supported by an endowment from the Osher Foundation. Classes are open to anyone over the age of 50. For a small annual fee, students can register for a wide range of short courses offered in classrooms at several different locations around Puget Sound. Courses are taught by carefully selected professors and community experts. Some are retired. Others, like David Smith, are in the midst of their careers and find these courses a refreshing change from traditional college classrooms. Most of the students are um, much older than a traditional college audience, which is interesting because they bring a life of experience with them into the classroom that traditional college students don't. And um, it's non-credit, so they don't have to take notes, they don't have to take exams or write papers. So they're, they're just here to learn because they want to learn. and it's. Um, the best audience you can imagine, full of people who want to learn. For lifelong learners like Bernard Silvernagel, it's a perfect fit. He's experienced Osher from both sides of the classroom, as an instructor and a student. Oh, I love it. It's continual stimulation uh, in the sense, with regard to the classes, uh, uh, what I found in many of them is that I've ultimately done a lot more. For example, I've taken some splendid classes in art an area that I had no familiarity with. Uh, and this led to me, me to do a lot of reading, uh, you know, going to art galleries and the like that I had, had never done before. But did they have a... Uh... Classes are typically offered in eight-hour courses taught in two-hour sessions twice a week for two weeks, which makes it easy to expand your horizons with dozens of new topics. You don't spend time studying towards an exam. In retirement, you don't want to study. You want to have fun. The scholars of Islam. So even long after those original degrees are earned, careers are launched, and families are raised, the debates and discussions can continue for lifelong students determined to never stop learning. It's like being a, a, a three-year-old. Whenever you encounter something totally new, you say, well, gee, I, I need to know that. You need to play with it. You need to work with the ideas. It keeps you mentally young uh, and open to, to new ideas. Uh, uh. 
The Osher Institute offers courses through UW at classroom sites in Seattle, Redmond, Everett, and Mercer Island. More than 900 people are currently members in that great program. Our next story is about the incredible partnership between the University of Washington and Seattle City Light. One of the most amazing parts of that partnership is how easily ideas are exchanged and projects are shared. A perfect example is the Sun Dog. It's an idea for a solar-powered mobile kiosk that was born at UW and is soon to be realized at Seattle City Light. Austin Seedentop reports. Soaking up the sun's rays, these flowers are Sonic Bloom, a solar-powered exhibit at the Pacific Science Center. Sonic Bloom is one of several projects paid for by UW partner Seattle City Light in their GreenUp Fund. GreenUp funded research and projects are designed to provide ideas, outreach, and education about energy efficiency and sustainability. The GreenUp Fund is a project that Seattle City Light started some time back. We joined voluntarily in 2006. The City Light is, uh, I think, a leader in the region, although certainly the other utilities are doing the same thing, but Seattle is such, so vast and has so many resources at its hands that that partnership is critical to us. And I love to see uh, what the utility companies are coming up with in terms of helping to educate me as a regular um, homeowner in terms of the opportunities that I have to do things a little bit different. Sonic Bloom is public to anyone who wants to visit, but is limited in that people have to travel to its home at the Pacific Science Center to see it. Enter Jack Newman. We got four different solar cell technologies connected to this wheel. A UW grad and Seattle City Light employee with a vision to take outreach directly to people. Jack is using funds from the GreenUp program to realize a project that he started at the university as an undergrad. The Sundog is a project I helped conceptualize when I was a student in the University of Washington's construction management program. I helped to develop a student organization that was focused on renewable energy and leadership, and we ended up fielding a lot of different types of events. And that led me to the conceptualization of a mobile solar kiosk to power events and relay awareness, or raise awareness and relay information about renewable energy. It gives information about energy scalability. It's a demonstration of solar cell technology. It's primarily for education, and the second iteration of this project would be more of a mobile store energy supply system that could actually power events while relaying this valuable information. Jack graduated from UW and began work at Seattle City Light as an energy consultant, and he took the idea with the Sun Dog with him. He is now using GreenUp funds to create the next generation of his project, MOBI. MOBI stands for Mobilizing Solar Energy. And the vision is to power community events while relaying educational content about renewable energy, conservation, utility partnerships. If you filled this square of solar, so one goal with the MOBI project is after sufficient testing and optimization to develop a fleet of them for use in the city departments, city of Seattle offices, partnerships in the community, public use for leadership-based events, and certainly for the University of Washington. That's the beauty of being a university like we are with some of the best minds, um, both with the students as well as the faculty, of course, and the staff, is working collaboratively then with our community partners, especially Seattle City Light. We're able to come up with things that we would never have come up with. We might have the great idea, you know, in terms of a faculty or a student. We can do the research. They can do the application. Whatever the future of energy may be, education and outreach are going to be critical parts of it and Seattle City Light and the University of Washington are going to be at the forefront. When we come back, advice for lonely hearts seeking romance online as UW 360 continues. Welcome back to UW 360. Before the internet, looking for love was often a matter of fate. Today, online dating has made meeting your mate a little easier, but it's also opened another door to scammers. To help you avoid a romance scam, we talked to UW sociology professor Pepper Schwartz, who's a national expert on love and relationships. When love is in the air, no one knows more about the birds and the bees than UW Professor of Sociology, Pepper Schwartz. 
we instinctively know that humans don't want to be alone. Pepper has been teaching at the University of Washington for more than four decades. All right, so here are some advice for getting back out there is Pepper Schwartz. She is She's also a nationally known expert, having written more than 20 books about relationships and sexuality. So this book is, um, I'll show you my book here, uh, Dating After 50 for Dummies. It's part of the Dummies series. Pepper's latest book helps people of a certain age find that special someone. For many, that means online dating. Any of these are, 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 are reasonable things to look for. As a love and relationship expert for AARP, Pepper gives advice about online do's and don'ts. You're online and you know you get this uh, person who starts to immediately you know tell you how wonderful you are and you know starts to talk seriously very quickly and if you're not cautious and if you're a little bit too vulnerable you just drink it in. You think this is great. And sometimes, sadly enough, it's not great. Unfortunately, what looks like love can actually be a romance scam. And these scams are sweeping the country, leaving behind empty promises and empty bank accounts. If somebody asks you for money, I don't care how good the reason seems to be, Nobody asks somebody for money under these situations, ever. No exceptions. No exceptions. Money should never pass between you. But I mean, really, really. According to Pepper, as with any online relationship, use caution with personal information and personal safety. You don't offer information that could be used against you. Never give your social security number. Uh, but you don't even give your home address. You don't go and meet somebody by their car that you don't know very well. Um, you don't want to be paranoid, but you also really want to be careful. I think this is a great first step, and then you just have to follow it up. You know, For Pepper Schwartz, online dating can have a happy ending. In fact, that's where she met her future husband. But she advises, if you've been a scam victim, report it to the Washington State Attorney General's office. By sharing information, you can help someone else avoid more than a broken heart. But I would say to people, you owe it to everybody else. Give this name, give everything you know about this person. Help somebody else avoid it. Pepper says if you are going to try online dating, it's better to use paid sites because those sites have people's credit cards and a way to trace the troublemakers. When we come back, take a stroll down the U District's beloved Ave as UW 360 continues. Welcome back, everyone. University Way Northeast, better known around here as the Ave, runs north to south, just west of campus. This street is one of the main attractions of the U District, and it'll soon see some pretty big changes. Austin Seedentoff takes a closer look at the AV today before it changes forever. University Way Northeast was built over a hundred... Who am I kidding? The AV. The AV was built over a hundred years ago as Seattle's second main city street. And since then, year after year, it's been changing, keeping up with the times. Kind of makes you wonder, what is the AV like today? What's it going to be like tomorrow? What is the state of the AV? Before we look at what things are like now, it's a good idea to see what the AV used to be like. And there's no better place to learn about the AV's past than Guy's Barber and Style Shop. See in a couple weeks. Welcome to Guy's. This is where I come to get my hair cut, or sometimes just stop by for a quick game of cribbage. The whole place is really a blast from the past, and Guy here, the founder, has seen a lot of the ad in his time. In June, I will be 90. June the 5th. Guy first came to Seattle in 1941 as part of his naval deployment in World War II. Why didn't you come around when I looked like that? <laughs> He came back to open up Guy's and has been on the Ave ever since 1960. The Ave used to be like what the University Village is now. Now uh, all you see around here is nothing but restaurants. We tried to keep it the, the old fashioned way here. 
neighborhoods change. And while guys might be a testament to the Avs' bustling neighborhood of the past, I wanted to see what things are like today. So, with a sharp new haircut, I went straight up the Ave to the University District Farmer's Market. The Farmer's Market represents the community it's in. It represents the U District. And I think if you walk through the market and you look really closely at the community that's here, you'll see its neighbors. I mean, people are stopping, taking the time to chat with one another. I think people are uh, want to see the retail core improve. Or I think people want to see families. They want to see a new school. Um, and yeah, I think the neighborhood can only improve over the next 10 years. Enter the University District Partnership, a coalition of the University District's prominent organizations aimed at bringing vitality back into the district. The partnership is a collaboration of the university, U District property owners, business owners, residents, social service agencies, and faith communities, along with the city of Seattle, working together to create a vibrant, innovative, and diverse university district. One of the biggest changes coming to the U District is the opening of a light rail station in 2021, right next to the Ave and the University District Partnership is preparing for its arrival. Well, this is the construction site for Sound Transit's new light rail station, where eventually 10,000 people a day will be coming and going from the light rail right here, which will have a big change in the composition of who's here and make it a much better place to uh, do business, to live and to work, because you'll have easy access to and from other locations in the city, just a couple of stops to downtown. It's everyone's neighborhood people from rich and poor and young and old and students and everyone else. The Ave is the UW's front porch. It has a rich history, a bright future, and I can't wait to see it. I'm Austin Seedentoff, and thanks for watching the State of the Ave. Austin says one of the U District Partnership's big successes has been a youth employment program where grant money has been used to hire young people living on the street to make the Ave a friendlier place. That does it for this edition of UW 360. If you'd like more information on any of the stories you saw today, just head to our website at uwtv.org slash UW360. You can also find us on Facebook and Twitter. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time with all new stories from the University of Washington. UW360 is proudly supported by AARP, partnering with the Washington Attorney General's On the Fraud Watch Network. More at aarp.org slash fraudwatchnetwork.